Welcome back to Haunted and Historic Australia for another episode in our Aussie Aliens and Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon series. In this particular episode, we take a look at the UFO sighting and disappearance of Frederick Valentich. 45 years ago to the day, what did he see and where did he go? On Saturday 21st of October 1978, a young man by the name of Frederick Valentich, who was 20 years old, rents a Cessna 182L light aircraft for a training flight to pick up King Island crayfish in the early evening. However, on the night of 21st of October 1978, this would be his last flight disappearing off the southeast coast of Victoria. But this is not just a disappearance. Frederick's last words to the air traffic control in Melbourne would be discussed and speculated on forevermore. Fred fuels up the Cessna and leaves Moorabbin Airport at around 6.15. It is strange because although he had done this journey before, he'd never done it at night time and he was afraid of travelling over the water as he was a poor swimmer. However, on this fateful night, he was sure he wanted to go ahead. It was a cloudless night and perfect weather, but does not radio ahead to King Island to ensure that the lights are on when he arrives, which was strange as although he spoke to his family about picking up King Island crayfish. He told the authorities and officials that he was collecting people from King Island as they did not like people taking crayfish in their aeroplanes as it was smelly and stinky and dirty. <laughs> he flew along the coast to Cape Otway Light Station at around 7pm when he radios through to the Moorabbin Air Traffic Control. Steve Roby receives this communication through the radio from Frederick. Well, he just made a standard position report over Cape Otway with an estimate for King Island. Um, I think he said he was operating below 5,000, and that was it. So far, things had been going very well with the flight. But only six minutes after he contacted Steve Roby initially, he contacts him again. This time, what Frederick would say would change Steve Roby's life forever. Frederick said, Melbourne, this is Delta Sierra Juliet. Is there any known traffic below 5,000? He asks if there are any other aircraft out at the time. Steve replies that there is not. Frederick advises that he is not alone in the sky. And this is a reenactment recording of the transcript that unfolded between Frederick Valentich and Steve Roby at the air traffic control in Melbourne. Melbourne, this is Delta Sierra Juliet. Is there any known traffic below 5,000 feet? No known traffic. Seems to be a large aircraft below 5,000 feet. What type of aircraft is it? I cannot confirm. It's four bright, seems to be like landing lights. The aircraft has just passed over me at at least 1,000 feet above. Is there any Air Force aircraft in the vicinity? No known aircraft in the vicinity. He seems to be playing some sort of game. He's flying over me. Well, the Sierra Juliet, it's not an aircraft. It's... Can you describe the, uh, the aircraft? As it's flying past, it's a long shape. I cannot identify it. It has such speed. Mm -hmm. It's before me right now, Melbourne. How large would the, um, the object be? Seems like it's stationary. What it's doing right now is orbiting. The thing is just orbiting on top of me. It's also got a green light and a sort of metallic light. It's shiny on the outside. It's just vanished. Is the aircraft still with you? Say again. Is the aircraft still with you? Now approaching from the southwest. Now Frederick starts to experience complications with the plane. 
what are your intentions? My intentions are to go to Tino Island, Melbourne. That strange aircraft's hovering on top of me again. It's hovering and it's not an aircraft. I can only imagine what Steve Roby must have been thinking when this was all happening. Describing as doing some fairly strange things, just listening to him, I can still remember it distinctly. Um, the way he was speaking to me in a broken communication, a form of uh, hesitant communication, he definitely sounded uh, as if he was under stress, and I could just picture him sort of in the aircraft looking around for this object in the sky. At 12 past 7 and 22 seconds, these were the last sounds to come from Valentich's Cessna. Despite Steve Roby continuing to try and make contact with Frederick Valentich, he could not get anything further over the radio from him. He was lost. Now it's worth noting that all of this that has occurred has happened just as dusk has set in. There's still a little light before the sun has completely set. Steve Roby is quite shaken and at 7.15, after not being able to contact Frederick again, alerts King Island to turn on the landing lights that a Cessna may be approaching. Being a clear night and still a little amount of light they could see from King Island to Cape Otway, there was no aircraft in the sky. There was a Cessna at King Island that was ready to take off. After the alert, it is then used to conduct a search for Frederick around the vicinity. For the next three days, they organise land, sea and air searches to try and find any sign of Frederick Valentich. They are unsuccessful. How could it be that he just disappeared? His friends and family believed that if he'd come into contact with a UFO, he would want to try and get home and they believed he may have crashed near the Victorian coastline trying to make this attempt home. They did their own searches along this coastline unsuccessfully also. Sadly, a witness that could have backed this theory up doesn't come forward for another seven years. The search was called off after three days of nothing at all. They'd combed a large area around the Victorian coast as well as King Island. The next morning it was all over the media, newspapers and television broadcasting the disappearance and possible UFO sighting of Frederick Valentich. My mum come in and she was crying and she said Fred's been in an accident. Most of that day I remember the news reports saying that they were searching for a pilot that had ditched into the sea. I cried for three days. I think I'd never stop crying. I, it really, it really gutted me that he disappeared. You know, it, it was a big hole in my life. That was his whole passion of flying. He loved it. The last years of his life, that's all he did. He dedicated everything to flying. As weeks rolled on with no further information about where Frederick was, the phones were running hot in the family's home. It got so bad, they couldn't leave their homes and lost their jobs. It was a fanfare of craziness that followed, and we'll get to that soon. But let's have a look at who Frederick was and why the authorities believed this to be an elaborate hoax by an unhinged and suicidal young man. Frederick was eager to gain his pilot's licence and he loved to fly. He had, however, failed his attempt to join the RAAF as his scores were too low. 
he had also had flying incidents that were going against him. Flying into a controlled zone in Sydney, as well as other citations for flying deliberately into clouds. His friends and family knew him to be a friendly and well-mannered young man, who had a girlfriend, close family and a mentor who was a friend in the industry assisting him to pass his commercial pilot's license. Any chance he got to fly, he was up in the sky. Although Frederick was very disappointed that he couldn't get into the RAAF, he was very eager and excited to be a commercial pilot. He enlisted the help of Edwin Robert Barnes, who was a squadron leader with the Air Training Corps that Fred was studying in. Fred had volunteered for no pay in the Air Training Corps to get more experience, and Barnes saw his enthusiasm. When Fred asked Barnes to be his private tutor, he agreed to help him in the navigation and aircraft performance areas. Fred would visit his home on Sundays for lessons, and Barnes was impressed by his enthusiasm and being so polite. He did have some shortcomings though, but Barnes felt that he had the capability, responsibility and discipline required to pass his next examinations in the July of that year. He wasn't wild like other boys his age, going out and getting drunk. He was quite disciplined in that respect and Barnes saw that and that's why he gave up his time to help him. As in 1977, Fred had failed many of his exams. So in 1978, having the help of Barnes as his tutor, he was very enthusiastic and hopeful that he would pass. Despite straight after the exams being so sure that he passed, even gloating and boasting to people that he was going to pass this time. He turned up at Barnes's home with girlfriend Rhonda Rushton, a 16-year-old from the area. They'd been dating several months, but had fallen for each other. To drink to the success of him passing his first exams, Barnes said he wouldn't drink. He would rather celebrate once Frederick had passed all of the five exams. Probably believing that it was a bit too early to be celebrating at this stage, considering he'd only done two out of the five so far. For all his excitement, however, he didn't pass those exams at all. Yet, still hopeful, he goes on to complete the third examination. However, he fails this also, and then does not bother to complete the next two. At this point, it seems as though he's given up. Yet, he tells everybody that he's passed, including Wanda. It isn't till several months later that he tells her that he'd failed. He gets into a contemplative state, but it doesn't seem to affect so much the way that he feels about Rhonda, as they've spoken about being married. He gives Rhonda a friendship ring and states that he wants to become engaged with her officially, not to tell anyone at this stage until she's 17. And that way, they will stay engaged for a year and then she'll be 18 and able to be married. It seems that although his piloting dreams may be ending, he's still got Rhonda and a loving family. But after Fred's disappearance, when everybody is questioned, things come to light, such as the lying about the pilot tests, the boasting of the passing and then not actually passing. Investigators and officials believe that Frederick Valentic was depressed and that this journey aiming to take his life because he no longer could deal with the fact that he couldn't become a pilot. He'd let everybody down, including himself, and he couldn't live with himself anymore. Lying to everybody, pretending to be someone he wasn't. But it's quite strange when you think about it. Why did he promise to be married to Rhonda? Was it just to get her hopes up, only to then commit suicide? It seems as if someone who was wanting or contemplating suicide 
would be wanting to close down relationships, not promise people anything, especially those that they loved or had strong feelings for. They'd planned a future. Was that only pending on his pilot's license? It seems very odd to me. But not as odd as some other things in this case, such as a little time beforehand, Alberta Valentich, Frederick's mother, and Frederick had seen a UFO, or thought they had. Alberta had seen it first and called to Frederick to come and join her, where he saw it too. They watched it for a little while before it shot off into the atmosphere. It was Guido that had gone public with this story after Frederick had gone missing. He also said that Frederick had witnessed a UFO at a different time when he was camping with the cadets in the Gippsland area. Rhonda confirmed to the authorities that she'd seen a pile of UFO clippings that Frederick had had in his possession. But she went on to say that although they'd spoken about the UFOs previously, she didn't feel that he was obsessed with it, and they only talked about it very few times. Guido stated that he believed Frederick was worried about an attack from space by the UFOs, by extraterrestrials. Could it be that Frederick had been abducted before? Was he honestly seeing UFOs because of this reason? I mean, you only have to pick up a book like Keith Basterfield's Close Encounters of an Australian Kind and look on the various Australian UFO websites to see how many sightings were reported around this decade. And this is in a time where it wasn't cool to believe in this. There was a lot of people being abducted or stating they'd been abducted who were laughed at and chastised in the communities for being idiots or lunatics making up these wild stories. And for Guido to say that his own wife had seen a UFO. Was it a last ditch effort to try and sway everybody from thinking that Frederick committed suicide? Or did he know it was time to tell possible secrets they'd kept about these sightings and visitations that they'd had? From what I've read and understood from various different sources, including Dolores Cannon and Linda Moulton Howe, these UAPs or UFOs, extraterrestrials, won't be seen unless they want to be seen. They are smart beings. And as per Stephen Greer, you could call them if you want to call them. Of course, there's an act doing it. Here is a quick CE5 protocol rundown from TikTok. Solenoid. In this videos, you will learn how to practice the CE5 protocol. The CE5 stands for Close Encounter of the Fifth Kind. It refers to a type of close encounter with extraterrestrial intelligence. CE5, a close encounter of the fifth kind involves conscious and direct communication with extraterrestrial beings. It is centered around the idea of initiating contact and establishing a peaceful and benevolent relationship with these intelligences. The goal is to promote consciousness, understanding, and peace on Earth through interaction with extraterrestrial civilizations. The protocol involves techniques such as meditation, visualization, and the use of light or sound signals to communicate with extraterrestrial beings. CE5 groups are formed, where participants gather in areas known for UFO sightings with the intention of witnessing these phenomena and establishing conscious communication with extraterrestrial entities. In summary, CE5 refers to a close encounter of the fifth kind, involving conscious and direct communication with extraterrestrial intelligence. Stay tuned. Step 1. Preparation. Find a quiet and dark location away from city lights, where you can have an unobstructed view of the night sky. Ideally, gather a group of individuals who are interested in ET contact. Group efforts can enhance the chances of success. Ensure you have basic equipment such as flashlights, cameras, audio recorders, radios, etc. Step 2. Relaxation and Meditation. Sit or lie down comfortably in a relaxed position. Take several deep breaths to calm and center yourself. 
Engage in a quiet meditation to quiet your mind and enter a state of relaxation. Step 3. Visualization. Visualize a bright and peaceful sphere of light surrounding yourself and the group. Imagine this sphere of light expanding its energy, encompassing the entire surrounding area. Visualize your intention to establish peaceful and benevolent contact with extraterrestrial intelligences. Step 4. Invocation and Signaling. Silently or softly speak an invocation, inviting any extraterrestrial intelligence present and willing to establish contact. Use flashlights or signaling lights to send flashes or light patterns towards the sky. You can also use sounds such as tones or gentle music to emit acoustic signals into space. Step 5. Observation and Recording. Maintain attentiveness and observe the sky for any unusual activity, such as strange lights, erratic movements, or unconventional patterns. If you witness something out of the ordinary, attempt to capture it through photographs or video and audio recordings. Step 6. Interaction and Communication. If any sightings or interesting phenomena occur, remain calm and continue observing. If you feel a connection or telepathic communication, stay open and receptive. You can mentally or verbally ask questions, hoping to receive responses or signs of communication. Step 7. Gratitude and Closure. At the conclusion of the session, express gratitude for any experiences or sightings, regardless of their nature or magnitude. Share your experiences with other group members and maintain an environment of respect and support. It's important to approach the CE5 protocol with an open mind, acknowledging that its effectiveness is not scientifically substantiated. Furthermore, sightings of unidentified flying objects, UFOs, can have conventional or natural explanations. Keep a balance of openness and skepticism, and critically evaluate any claims or experiences encountered. You can see evidence of this if you watch the Disclosure series by Dr. Stephen Greer on Prime Video or the Gaia channel, and various other Stephen Greer videos on YouTube. Now back to the case. It seems before this disappearance, the Valentich family were not talking about this kind of stuff. They weren't yelling it out to their neighbours and telling everybody that this was happening. It was only after the disappearance that these things have come to light. Frederick Valentich wasn't even gloating about seeing a UFO to his girlfriend. If he was trying to make a go of getting his pilot's license, I think it was in his best interest not to say anything about UFOs at all. So did he just go out in a big bang when he failed his pilot's license? Or was something more sinister at play? Frederick Valentich was a calm, disciplined, responsible young man. And with so many sightings at the time around the areas of Tasmania and Victoria, you've got to wonder, was this a big cover-up? A conspiracy? It's not the first time. Now there's many people out there who have been abducted not just once, but many times. And there is a belief out there also that most people have come into contact with an alien presence. People like Whitley Stryber, who wrote the book Communion and several others to follow that, has been abducted many times and has many tales to tell about these abductions. And although it may seem cool to have said in these times that you've been abducted, a lot of these people came forward in a time that it was laughed at, ridiculed and downright dangerous where the government was concerned. Many were threatened about their sightings, especially if you were in the military or Air Force. So although the authorities had put together many pieces of evidence stating that Frederick's state of mind leading up to this journey, this flight, was unstable, was it really about his pilot's license that seemed really the only thing going wrong in his life? He had lovely parents, he had wonderful family, siblings, he had a lovely girlfriend. He was young and had the whole world at his feet. He could have done anything. Would one thing, like maybe not getting your favourite job or the job you always wanted, be enough to commit suicide for? For all purposes, he wasn't a depressed person. He may have been down in the dumps because he kept failing exams. But was he really depressed enough to end his own life? 
it could have been a spur of the moment decision. Maybe he was feeling down that night. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of strange things that occurred. Leading up to this journey was an anniversary for Rhonda and Frederick. He was meant to take her out on the Saturday night and he'd forgotten about it. His mind was consumed with the pilot tests and getting hours up. He was still wanting to become a pilot. He was still getting hours and he felt his best in the air. It is a strange case. His friends and family do not believe he took his own life. The authorities believe that there could be five explanations for the disappearance. One, that he crashed, whether by suicide or by accident, and they could not find the wreckage. Perhaps it sunk. Two, he ditched deliberately into the water and sunk without any debris. Three, there was a controlled landing elsewhere and he's just decided to take off, change his identity perhaps, live another life. Four, he attempted to take the plane somewhere else, out of the area that they believed he would have crashed into and crashed elsewhere. Whether he survived or not, they don't know. He may have crash landed and still decided to find another life somewhere else. Or five, UFO involvement. Was he abducted and taken somewhere else? It is the fifth explanation for a reason. And clearly government bodies don't want to believe that there are UAPs or UFOs or extraterrestrials for that matter. Despite interviewing all the people involved directly after the disappearance, it would take them two and a half years before the investigation would be completed. Right, now it is at this point in my research, in my investigating, that I realised I found too much bloody information and it's going to spill over onto a part two. I'm sorry about that, but <laughs> I find this information so intriguing and I can't leave anything out. So I'm, I'm going to have to make this part one, the actual disappearance of Frederick Valentich. Now for part two, I have to do all the other sightings that were in the area at the time. Now when I started this, and with a little research, I'd seen maybe one or two. But after finding or stumbling onto Keith Basterfield's website on what he says he and a couple of researchers found has just blown my bloody mind. It literally has. There's too much to fit. I'm going to be running into almost an hour with this and I'd rather take my time, go into a little more detail on each one. So I'm going to end the video here with the fact that Frederick Valentich disappeared under very sketchy circumstances. Did he take his own life? Or has something else happened to him? Because the more I'm reading about these other sightings, I can't believe that he would have taken his own life. Not with everything else going on in the area leading up to and on the actual day of his disappearance, people cited stuff. I don't know what to say other than you have to tune in for part two because this is just crazy. There's so much more to come. There's just, it'll blow your mind if your mind can be blown. Skeptics will always be skeptic. But if you've got an open mind, then oh my God, what a journey you'll have in part two. Well, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Stay tuned for part two next weekend. If you like this episode on Frederick Valentich's disappearance, give the video a like. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you know when I'm posting up part two.
I every now and then think about what could have happened and I still draw to the same conclusion. I just don't know.